And while you're waiting, if you want to grab a Bible and open up to Romans 1. Sorry, I don't have any uh, clever little jokes this morning. I didn't prep for that. But one thing I did do is as I was prepping through this and going through Romans 1 and and praying about it and, and just seeking God through it, I recognized I was halfway through verse 1, and I was like five pages into my sermon. And so I told Selita, I'm like, I got the intro, introduction, and then I get to this point, and I'm here, and she's like, uh, that's not going to fly. You're, you're going to have to rein it in a little bit, Stephen. Uh, so I did do that. I did rein it in a little bit. Uh, I think we're, we're probably right about four hours today versus, you know. <laughs> the six to eight that I was actually working through. Uh, I'm just kidding. I think everyone's just finishing up and then we'll get started. Well, why don't we pray and bless the Lord's time through his word. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for standing for truth and being truth in a time where there is questionable truth. You are the absolute truth. You are the life giver. You are the beginning and end, the Alpha and Omega. Father, are we truly devoted to you? We pray that that is what we are. We pray that your word penetrates us today. There's some challenging words in this introduction that Paul gives us, and it makes us have to self-examine. I pray, God, that we self-examine today, as I've had to during this prep time. Pray that your word penetrates and changes hearts, Lord, and that I get out of the way. Make this not me and my words, but your words, Father. Pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Awesome. So Romans 1. Everyone's just as excited as I am, I can tell. So today we embark on a transformational journey through this introduction. It's not through the full book. It's not even through the full chapter. We're talking seven verses. And specifically what I'm going to do is actually focus on really verse one and two. We will dive through all of them. I will get us there. So if I get, if you're like, I'm only, he's still only through halfway of one. There's a reason. Trust what I'm doing, and uh, we'll get ourselves through this and really see the transformational power of what Paul is doing, just in a simple introduction. This letter encapsulates the essence of the gospel and its life-changing power. In these opening verses, Paul lays the foundation for us, unveiling the profound truths of God's grace, the identity of Christ, and the call to obedient faith. So we're going to dive in together and discover what the depths of this gospel message has, and it has the power to save and transform lives. Now, this is the book where John Wesley shared, in the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to Epistles to the Romans, and about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. John Wesley, as we know, a great man of faith and of the word and of missionary work. Romans transformed him. Martin Luther, reading Romans, came to realize that salvation was a gift for the guilty, not a reward for the righteous. Man is not saved by his good works, but by trusting the finished work of Christ. Thus, justification by faith alone became the central tenet of the Reformation, and boy, are we blessed and thankful for that. Now, we've heard Pastor Tim speak before about Romans, and he says it's the crown jewel of Paul's writing. I completely agree. It is a favorite book of mine in God's Word, and it stands as the pinnacle of theological insight and spiritual depth within the New Testament canon. It also has ironing sharpened iron, where we have believers that believe different things based on a lot of what Romans teaches alone because it's so important. So we're, we're not going to get into the full depths of Roman 8 and 9 and everything else, or, and then how that ties into John and everything else. I could, but I won't, for your sake. You could say thank you to later, maybe during fellowship time. But what's interesting is the word God occurs 153 times in Romans. 
It's interesting. An average of once every 46 words. This is more frequent than any other New Testament book. However, it is a key to what Paul is trying to accomplish and tell us. So what I'd like is everyone to please stand with me as we read the words of our Lord together. I told you, we're going to get moving. Warm up. All right, Romans 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, Peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may sit down. Thank you. Now, I, I know you're probably thinking, why? Why just the first seven verses? Why just the greeting? Paul's simply just introducing himself to the Church of Rome, in which he has not been to yet. There's some truth to that, yes. However, if it's in his word, it's worth studying. Amen. And so we need to look at this in depth because there's some profound things that he says and how he introduces himself. Written again by the Apostle Paul, we know this because he, he says who he is. This letter to the church in Rome is really a masterful exposition of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Its implications for both Jews and Gentiles. He had a heart for Gentiles. Believers. So I want to briefly just make sure we paint this picture so that we know why he's writing the letter and who he was. So this epistle was written, this letter was written right around A.D. 57, 58. It depends on who you're studying and who you're looking to. Um, but I think it's right in that period of time. It was during his third missionary journey while he was in Corinth. Uh, the church in Rome was a vibrant and diverse community of both Jewish and Gentile believers. And actually at about... A.D., I think it was 45, 47, um, the, the leader of Rome at that time, that Caesar, had actually kicked out Jewish believers. So we had Jews actually fleeing Rome. They weren't there. They started to trickle back about A.D. 54. So to put this into perspective of Rome and why it's so diverse and so important here is you're talking three years of Jews believers specifically coming back to a church that was specifically Gentile. It's just an interesting dynamic that I don't think we really fully grasp or think through. But as he's talking here and sharing his greeting, know that that's part of it. That is an important piece to it. His desire was to visit and strengthen this church in Rome. It was fueled, as we find in chapter 15 of Roman, Romans, that Paul was hoping to stop and visit on his way to evangelize in Spain. Paul, who we know was originally Saul of Tarsus, was born into a devout Jewish family in the city of Tarsus, located in the region of Cilicia, which is modern-day Turkey. He was well-educated in the traditions of Judaism and trained as a Pharisee under the renowned teacher Germanel. In this zeal for the Jewish faith, as we know, Saul per persecuted the early Christians, viewing them as a threat to the established order. And boy, were, were they. However, everything changed on the road to Damascus. We're not going to go through Acts uh, 9, 1 through 19 to see that. However, he was changed on the road. He encountered Christ in a dramatic conversion experience, again, that you can find in Acts. After this encounter with Jesus, Saul became Paul. Nice play on words there, right? I'm sure that was intentional. And then was on fire for the Lord and started his ministry. So he went from going after Christians to kill them and persecute them to standing with those Christians. That's powerful. That's what the gospel does. All right, let's get into it. Verse 1, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. In these opening verses of Romans, Paul introduces himself as a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle 
uh, an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. This self-identification carries profound implications for both Paul's ministry and our understanding of discipleship. Now, some of you may have different words in there for bond servant. Some may have servant, and then others, translated, would say slave. Now, we're going to park here for a little bit, okay? Here we go. <laughs> Buckle up. Bond servant, or many, like I said, had servant in their translations, or more appropriately, is slave. The literal term in the Greek is doulos. Doulos literally means slave, Okay, that's profound and it's different because servant and slave are different. And I got to pull myself back because otherwise I'm going to I'm going to lose myself and go forward too quickly. Slave doulos, it means a slave, a bondman, a man of servile condition, a slave. This one I really want to focus on devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interest. Now, we sang a lot of songs this morning that talked about us surrendering to God and his goodness and his gracefulness and his graciousness, right? At the cross for what he did. Because he was devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interest. It was the interest of his father. Now, I don't have time to go through the entire structure here of slave ownership in the ancient world versus what we see here in America or, or the past. Uh, we know that there were very violent and ungodly uses of slavery throughout history. And there were times in the Old Testament and the New Testament where a slave would choose to stay entrusted and submitted to their master and their household. Interesting concept. Why? And what would happen if, when that person did that? When they did, there was a required ritual that was um, needed to be done. And that's where the master would take him to a door, okay, put his earlobe against the doorpost and puncture a hole through his ear to mark it. At that moment, he was a man marked for life as belonging to that house. He could be set apart. He was seen as a member of that, wholly devoted, devoted excuse me, fully devoted to that house and that master. Now, this is at the very heart of what Paul is sharing he is a slave fully devoted to Jesus Christ first and foremost. Now, here comes the hard stuff. Jim asked me to bring it, so I'm going to bring it. How are we, dear Christians, in bearing his mark? I was challenged by that. I've had to wrestle with this because this question is too important. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, he says to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is full submission. This is nothing lukewarm. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's clear. Paul is clear. And if Paul is clear as an apostle of Christ, then Christ is clear. Amen? It all works together. Complete logic. Pastor John MacArthur wrote a book called Slave, where he actually looks at this word, this word transformed him, and his outlook on um, the word doulos and what it really meant in Scripture. He says, we call ourselves Christians. We proclaim to the world that everything about us, including our very self-identity, is found in Jesus Christ, because we have denied ourselves in order to follow and obey him. He is both our Savior and our Sovereign, and our lives center on pleasing him. To claim the title is to say with the Apostle Paul, to live as Christ and to die as gain. And we find that in Philippians 1.21. He continues discussing the word servant and slave. There's a key distinction between the two. Servants, they are hired. Slaves, they are owned. Are you owned by God? Are you owned by Jesus Christ? Or do you just say it in, in word but your life looks nothing like it. That's the challenge. And that's off of one word. That's why the, the word is so incredible. And that's, of course, what I've been going through of being refined of, my goodness, is my life fully devoted? You know I have, those that have seen me, I wear a hat that says, do not conform to this upside down. I do mean that, but my life is not always lived out the way it's supposed to be. Boy, was I challenged by this. Paul is using this word in visual on purpose for us. 
It held weight, and Paul's sole ambition was to be pleasing to Christ, fully sold out to him. Now, it's challenging to examine ourselves and ask that question, is the Lord Lord of our life? Are we fully devoted to him and disregard our own interests? That's the challenge. Paul's making it very clear to the, to the church. This is who I am, and this is why. Now, contemporary Christianity doesn't share in this outlook or this language. It's more about health, wealth, pursuit of happiness. God wants us to live our best life now. Jesus is more of a genie designed to fulfill our wishes. We name it and claim it, manifest it, and God will bless it, right? All the mumbo-jumbo. We don't see this in his word, though. It's a distortion of his word. Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and we're fully devoted and surrendered to him. We are either his slave or we are slave to sin and the world. It's either or. There's no middle. We're not adding Jesus to our lives. We're not penciling him in. It is full submission to him, fully seeking him and pleasing him above all else. Are we a body that does that? That's the challenge that Paul has in not even the complete first verse. That's the challenge. Michael Horton states that early Christians were not fed to wild beasts and dipped in wax and set ablaze as lamps in Nero's garden because they thought Jesus was a helpful life coach or role model, but because they witnessed to him as the only Lord and Savior of the world. Does it transform or not? That's the question. Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorites, the Prince of Preachers, stated, where our authorized King James Version of the Bible softly puts its servant, it really is bond slave. The early saints delighted to count themselves Christ's absolute property, bought by him, owned by him, and wholly at his disposal. Paul even went as far to rejoice that he had the marks of his master's brand on him. And he cries, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. There was the end of all debate. He was the Lord's. And the marks or, or the scourges, the rods and the stones were the broad arrow of the king, which marked Paul's body as the property of Jesus the Lord. If the saints of old time gloried in obeying Christ, I pray that you and I may feel that our first object in life is to obey God. It's powerful. Now, this is a shock to the system for us in America, where we have freedom. America, freedom's taught, practice, and called to right. However, we're a very materialistic country where our blessings are plentiful, and the very idea of our full rights being given up is difficult, if not completely rejected. Now, as I stated, I'm guilty of this as well, undisciplined and just plain sinful. I hate it. And MacArthur Fuller continues and states, in fact, it's difficult to manage a concept more distasteful to modern sensibilities than that of slavery. Western society in particular places a high premium on personal liberty and freedom of choice. So to present the good news in terms of a slave-master relationship runs contrary to everything our culture holds dear. Such an approach is controversial, confrontational, and politically incorrect. Yet, that is precisely the way the Bible speaks about what it means to follow Christ. We got to change our language, brothers and sisters. We got to be bold for the faith, regardless this initial intro is such an eye-opener to really examine ourselves as we ask, are we fully devoted and submitted to our Lord who has marked us with his shed blood on the cross or not? All right. We can continue. The second section of the first verse states, called to be an apostle. It's interesting to note that he's a slave of Christ first and then an apostle second. Paul's calling as an apostle highlights the divine commissioning and authority bestowed upon him by Christ himself. He was not self-appointed, but chosen and set apart by God for the proclamation of the gospel. This call to apostleship underscores the authority with which Paul writes to the Roman church. He's not merely offering his personal opinions, what his thoughts are. 
he is conveying the message entrusted to him by Jesus Christ himself. This emphasizes the sovereignty of God in selecting and equipping his messengers for his redemptive purposes. Now, the next portion says, separated to the gospel of God. Now, that separated, that Greek word, aphorizo, hey, I actually said it right this time, praise the Lord. Uh, it means to divide, cut apart, or sever to the gospel of God. It's an important thing to think about. He's actually saying, I am actually severed, I'm cut apart for just this, which then makes sense to why he's saying he's a slave, right? It's, it's bringing the whole thing together. He's articulating his central focus and passion. It's simply this. It's the proclamation of the gospel, period. End of story. He sees himself as uniquely commissioned and empowered by God to proclaim the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. This gospel, he emphasizes, is not merely his own message, but is the message of God, the divine plan of redemption for humanity. Verse 2. Let's get to verse 2. Which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In this verse, we see the Apostle Paul laying the groundwork for this letter to the Church of Rome by highlighting the, continu the continuousness between the Old Testament Scriptures and the message of Jesus Christ. This serves as a bridge or a conduit between the Jewish heritage of Christianity and its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And then we see it says in verse 2, uh, which he promised before. That's how it starts. It underscores the idea of divine foreknowledge and intentionality. It suggests that God had a plan in place long before its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The plan was not haphazard or improvised, but was part of God's overarching purpose for us. You see, he didn't see us and just say, oh, I wasn't expecting that. I've got to have to do this, this. Oh, no, nope, someone just did that. I've got to do this, this, and this. He had the plan. It was, already, it was already done before the foundation of the world. He knew what he was going to do, knew how he was going to do it, and it's just us living it out. He continues his prophets. That term emphasizes the role of prophecy in the Old Testament uh, scriptures. Throughout Israel's history, we know God spoke through prophets who foretold the coming of the Messiah and proclaimed God's will to the people. By mentioning the prophets, Paul's highlighting authority of their message and how it continues with the message he's about to proclaim concerning Jesus Christ. As we know, the Jews were seeking the Messiah. They were waiting for the Messiah. They do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, right? There's those that do not. What Paul was trying to do is to bridge the gap to show that he is the Lord. He is the one that was foretold. He is the one that, was, that the prophets spoke about. And as we dig in, the whole, in the Holy Scriptures, this underscores the sacred nature of the writings. Paul's referring to, in Paul's context, this refers primarily to the Jewish Scriptures, what Christians now call the Old Testament. By describing them as holy, Paul emphasizes their divine origin and their significance for understanding God's plan of salvation. The message of Jesus Christ is not a new invention, but the fulfillment of God's long-standing promises. This verse lays a foundation for Paul's argument throughout the letter that salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ and that this truth is rooted in God's eternal plan as revealed in Scripture. Let's go to verse 3. We're going to go to verse 3 and 4. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Verses 3 and 4, Paul unveils the heart of the gospel to us. The person and work of Jesus Christ... Through his incarnation, his death and resurrection, Christ has brought salvation and hope to all who believe through repentance and faith. Paul emphasizes Jewish, uh, excuse me, Jesus' human, human lineage, stating that he was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. This reference aligns with the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, particularly in passages we find in 2 Samuel 7 and Isaiah 11. 
by tracing Jesus' ancestry back to David, Paul highlights Jesus' fulfillment of Jewish expectations for the long-awaited Messiah who was prophesied to come from the line of David, bridging the gap. Okay, remember slave, doulos, and bridging the gap, Old and New Testament. That's everything that is going on in this section of Scripture. He then shifts his focus to Jesus' divine nature, declaring that he was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Here Paul presents Jesus as the Son of God, not merely in a biological sense, but in terms of his divine identity and authority. The phrase, in power, suggests the, de the decisive and authoritative nature of Jesus' identity as the Son of God, affirmed by his resurrection from the dead. And as we know, this proves whether he is God or not, the resurrection. It demonstrates his victory over sin and death and confirming his divine status. So by combining these elements, we find Jesus' human uh, lineage from David and his divine exaltation through the resurrection, Paul prevents a complete view of Jesus Christ as fully both human and fully divine. This theology, there's a theology based off of this. It's known as the hyperstatic union. Okay, it's clear that there is a distinction that he was fully God and fully divine. Now, we're not going to take the time to dive into that because that's another several hours of really working through that and what does that mean. And a lot of it is uh, we can ask him when we get up there, okay, uh, because it, 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 there's truly some miraculous things going on during that time. This understanding of Jesus as uh, the Messiah and the exalted Son of God forms the theological foundation for Paul's subsequent discussions that we find uh, later in the letter to the Romans. However, it's laying the groundwork for his exploitation of salvation and righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. It's so simplistic yet so deep. That's why I love this so much. All right. Verse 5 through 7. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience of the faith, excuse me, to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul expands on the purpose and the recipients of this apostolic ministry while also extending a greeting to the Romans, plain and simple. He emphasizes that it is through Jesus Christ that he and his fellow apostles have received both grace and apostleship. The term grace here refers to God's unmerited favor and empowerment, which enables Paul and others to fulfill that calling. This grace is not merely for personal benefit, but is given for the purpose of apostleship, emphasizing the divine commission and authority behind Paul's ministry. The goal of this ministry, according to Paul, is for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. He has it right there. This phrase encapsulates the overarching purpose of Paul's missionary endeavors to call people to obedient faith in Jesus Christ, resulting in the glorification of God's name among all peoples. Beautiful how that works. The gospel message is intended to go to all nations, all people. It's not just Jews. Right? It's for all of us. Otherwise, most of us here would be uh, in trouble. It's for all. The gospel is not limited to a particular ethnicity, ethnicity excuse me, or culture, but is intended for the salvation of all mankind. As ambassadors of Christ, we are called to proclaim this message boldly, making disciples of all nations. Again, how's that going for us? I know I'm guilty. Paul then addresses his audience, which includes the Roman Christians. He reminds them that they are among those called of Jesus Christ, highlighting their identity as followers of Christ, who have been chosen by God for salvation and belonging to his kingdom. 
Finally, Paul offers a greeting of grace and peace to the recipients of the letter, affirming God's love for them and their status as called to be saints. He's never met these people, by the way. This term saints refers to all believers who are set apart for God's purposes and sanctified by their union with Christ. So this section 5 through 7 underscores the divine origin and purpose of Paul's apostolic uh, ministry. It emphasizes a universal call, again, to obedient faith in Jesus Christ and extends God's grace and peace to the Roman Christians, highlighting their identity as beloved saints. These verses set the tone for Paul's subsequent discussions of theological truths and practical exhortations in the rest of the letter to the Romans. Romans 1, 1 through 7, it serves as a rich introduction to Paul's letter to the Romans, laying out foundational theological truths and setting the stage for the discourse that follows. Paul begins by identifying himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. Not a servant, a slave. It's powerful. This underscores, his, he's underscoring his humility and submission to the authority of his Lord. He further asserts that he does have an apostolic calling, emphasizing the divine commission he has received to proclaim the gospel of God. He's setting himself as one that truly can speak on these things. Central to Paul's message is the person of Jesus Christ, which I certainly hope it would be, whom he describes as both fully human, descending from David, and fully divine, declared to be the Son of God through the resurrection. This dual nature, again, the hyperstatic union of Christ forms the cornerstone of Paul's theology and informs his understanding of salvation and righteousness. His mission is directed towards the obedience of faith among all nations with the aim of glorifying God's name. He extends this call to the Roman Christians, emphasizing their identity as long as, as, as those who belong to Jesus Christ, loved by God and called to be saints. Throughout these verses, we continue to see that Paul underscores the themes of grace, obedience, the universal scope of God's redemptive plan. He highlights the interconnectedness of faith and obedience, stressing the transformational power of the gospel to bring about salvation and sanctification in the lives of believers. In offering that greeting of peace and grace, he's extending his love, God's love and blessing to the recipients of the letter, expressing his desire for their spiritual well-being and growth in Christ. He cared and loved for people. Maybe we, may we be reminded of the transformational power of the gospel, the power to save, the power to heal, and to reconcile us to God. Let us embrace our identity as slaves of Christ called to proclaim his message of redemption to the ends of the earth. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ empower us to live lives marked by obedient faith and unwavering devotion to his cause. Now, those that have surrendered their life to Christ, through repentance and faith, are call, are the called, as Apostle Paul tells us. Now, I'm sure there are some in this very room that know or doubt that they are part of the called. The same Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to pen Romans is the same Holy Spirit indwelling in us who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Have you done that? And even if you have... Are there things that we need to have worked on in our life? What areas are there? Scripture tells us we were born into sin through Adam and in desperate need of a Savior. Started with the nation of Israel, as told in the Old Testament, where animal sacrifices were introduced as a covering, right? The blood for their sin. But one was coming that would remove sin. God knew that our sins separated us from him. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our sacrifice. He lived a sinless, perfect life to fulfill the perfection God required and paid the penalty for us. Dying on the cross for the sins of those who place their faith in him. We cannot earn our way to heaven. We cannot say things over and over again in a specific way, swinging specific items in order to get us to heaven. 
Scripture tells us that nobody is good. There's no one good. No, not one. And all have fallen short. We find that in Romans. Paul just keeps bringing it, the entire book, by the way. You need a Savior, and we need Jesus. Amen? Now, you may be thinking, okay, that's all good. It's all nice, Stephen. I don't really know God. I don't care to know God, or maybe I do, or you don't understand. Maybe I don't. But I do know this. If you came to me and you said, Stephen, you don't know what my hands have done. You don't know the things my hands have done. It set me apart from God. Well, Christ has taken two nails in each hand and bled for those things. I think you can see where I'm going with this. Stephen, you don't know where my feet have taken me and caused me to go to sin and set myself apart from God. Well, Christ took a nail to his feet and bled for you to cover those. Okay, Stephen, you got me there and there. But you don't know the wicked thoughts in my head. You don't know the things I thought about and how just wrong and wicked they were. Well, what did Christ do? Took a crown of thorns to his head and blood so that you may be forgiven. There is power in Christ. There is forgiveness in Christ. There is rest in Christ. So wherever you are in your walk, I don't know where that is. It could either be being challenged because we're not truly a slave to Christ. We're not fully devoted to him apart from our own desires. That, I think, on the one hand, those are the believers, right? That, the, okay, we got to work through that. Paul's identifying himself as that. Am I really that? Am I really living my life that way? Am I fully submitted to him? Am I removing myself from the culture? Now, we're stuck in this culture. However, we don't have to be in it, right? I mean, excuse me, we're in it, but not of it, right? We can be different. We need to be different by design because we're seeking God through that. And then there's those that are saying, okay, I'm not any of those things. I'm not saved. I haven't surrendered my life. Or maybe I have at some point, but I really don't know what's going on with it. I would challenge that that never really happened in the first place. And I seek that you actually surrender your life today. This isn't something we did as a baby or anything else. It's you making that decision, crying out to God for your sin it needs to be a very personal experience. Can't just say the prayer, come up, sign a card, and boom, you're done, you're in. It doesn't work that way. We don't see that in Scripture. What we do see is God calling us to repent. So what does it mean to repent? We need to turn from our sin. We need to forsake it, get rid of it, and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you have doubt, challenge the doubt. Are you growing in your faith? Do you have the fruits of the Spirit? Are they making you grow each day through the Holy Spirit or not? If you're unsure, come talk to me afterwards. The invitation is there. The invitation is to come after service, find me, find any other here that will be willing to pray and um, help you through that process. Okay? It's too important. So make today the day you come to Christ the repentance of all the sin you've done and be cleaned and healed from the lies of this world. It wasn't so bad, was it? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge that you've given us as to what it really means to seek you, to go after you, to be fully submitted to you. They're not easy words. However, Paul grabbed those and lived them out fully. It's a challenge for us to have to do the same thing, for us to seek you and you alone, for us to submit to you and to you alone, for you to fully be Lord of our life fully surrendered, to be a slave, a proud slave that is marked by Christ. That is our call. 
That is what we seek. I pray, Lord, that anyone here that, do, that does not know you, that you spoke to them, that the Spirit has convicted them of their sin and their unrighteousness, that they seek after you, and that they come to a saving faith. And for those here that are struggling with that, it's simply this. Go to Christ with your sin. Cry out for forgiveness. Ask for repentance. And then turn away and seek Christ. Seek him in his word. Seek him through prayer. Seek him through community. Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet. And it's a light unto our path. I pray that we were challenged, encouraged today. We ask as we sing this final song, Lord, that we make our voices loud and proud and heard so that you get the glory. Because this is why we're here. It's to give you glory, Lord. It's not of us. We're not seeking anything from this. It's only to be fully devoted to you. We thank you again for this day. Thank you for all that could be here. We pray for those that could not be here and those that are sick and ill. We pray, Father, that you heal them, that you grant them peace as they recover. And for those traveling, Lord, we pray for safety. We love you. We thank you. We want to honor you with this final song. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Thank <clears throat> you.